We continue in worship as we hear our scripture reading for this morning coming from Psalm 25, the first 10 verses. Would you hear now this Psalm of David, the word of the Lord. O oh Lord, I give my life to you. I trust in you, my God. Do not let me be disgraced or let my enemies rejoice in my defeat. No one who trusts in you will ever be disgraced, but disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. Show me the right path, O oh Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. All day long, I put my hope in you. Remember, O oh Lord, your compassion and unfailing love, which you have shown from long ages past. Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in the light of your unfailing love, for you are merciful, O oh Lord. The Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. He leads the humble in doing right, teaching them his way. The Lord leads with unfailing love and faithfulness all who keep his covenant and obey his demands. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God. You are good and you are faithful. You are righteous and merciful. Full of grace and abounding in steadfast love, O oh God. David knew well your heart, O oh Lord. As the scripture testifies, as you have said of him yourself, he was a man after your heart. And Lord, we long to be like David in that sense. And so Lord, would you open our hearts now, make them tender to receive your word, what you would speak by your Holy Spirit now among your people. May the words of my mouth and may the meditation of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O oh Lord, our rock our Redeemer, and we give you thanks for what you are speaking. Let us hear, let us trust, and let us live in the light of your word. Lord, show us the path. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. It's always a a blessing and a privilege to spend this time together. And as you've heard Tim and others say so far this morning, the Lord is certainly with us and uh, his, he's always with us. We believe that uh, as the scriptures say, he uh, will never leave us, never forsake us. Uh, Jesus said, I'm with you always to the end of the age, speaking to his first disciples. And I believe he still speaks that to his disciples today. But there is such a thing as becoming more aware of his presence, isn't there? And what that means to be mindful of who God is right now with us, to us, for us, and within us. And that's the thing, we, we talk about a response of worship, we talk about a response of, of, of praise, we talk about a response of even obedience, but you hear that word that I use, it's a response. He takes the first step and the second, and the third, and the fourth. He is the one who has come to us. So today I want to encourage you to continue just to open yourself as best you can in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to receive what the Lord is speaking. One of the ways that we're growing right now as a church, and I want to take just a minute to remind you of this before we dive into the sermon. Life groups are being formed right now, and some of you have all kinds of experience in life groups. Some of you, this is a brand new thing, and so uh, we want you to know that throughout the week, in the coming weeks, we're going to be starting groups. They're going to be meeting in homes in different parts of the city. There'll be groups that are meeting here on campus, especially on, on Wednesday night when we have choir rehearsal happening and children's and youth 
ministry is happening then and so many different things. And so you can go right to the link in our online uh, uh, bulletin right now, our digital bulletin, or you can go to the website and find out where is a group that's meeting near you, uh, what day of the week and what time and uh, different Ages are gathering, some are, are, all the kids are involved, others are, are for adults uh, only, and we have other kids' activities happening, so there's just so many different options, but here's the point. None of us can walk through this life following Jesus alone. And we are so thankful for our Sunday school classes that meet at nine o'clock, and if you're not a part of one of those, I highly encourage you to become one. We're so thankful for the ways we gather corporately on Sundays and, and, and special times like last Wednesday night for Ash Wednesday, beginning the Lenten season. But you need a community of people that you are tight with. You need a group of people. And, and our life groups are 10 to 12 folks, a group that you can do life with. So that when things happen, and we all know things happen in life, whether it's celebration or whether it's, it's, it's hard things, whether it's suffering, when these things come on us, having those people you are instantly connected with who are gonna know about it before anybody else does because they are there with you and you are there with them, that's, that's what we all need, following Jesus together. And so life groups are about Christ-centered community in that way, and as a foundational part of that, we're going to be talking about what we're studying in the scriptures together on Sundays. That's gonna be part of what we're unpacking and applying in and through life groups throughout the week. So it's a beautiful way that we get to go deeper in smaller groups together all throughout the week uh, as we grow as a church, all right? And so as we believe God is drawing people of every tribe and nation and tongue to be a part of Christ's church, as we believe God is, is, is preparing us for what is uh, yet to come, not only in our country and in the world, and, and I don't say that necessarily to, to instill fear, I just, how many of you know that, that life, whatever we plan, it's always gonna go a different way? <laughs> uh, my daughter's getting ready for college, and so I'm especially aware of that right now. But anyway, all that to say, we, we need to be in this together. And so if you have community that you can count on like that in the life of the church already, praise God, praise God. If you don't have that, we're building that right now. So go and check that out and sign up, be a part of this. We're continuing to add groups. We're continuing to, to recognize leaders that God is equipping and training those leaders and that's such an important thing. So I hope that you will take us up on that opportunity. This past Wednesday night, we began, as I said, the liturgical season of Lent. It was Ash Wednesday, a night when we remember our own mortality. It was a pretty hot Valentine's Day night uh, date if you needed one, so if you weren't here, you missed out. But it's not meant to be morose, it's not meant to be macabre at all. It is very much a matter of us recognizing the reality of our situation, who we are as human creatures, who we are as those who are desperately in need of the one who has made us for himself. Lent is this 46 day season of, of preparation. It's 40 days plus six Sundays. So we have six weeks until we get to Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday as we call it. And in that 40 days, we are meant to be reminded particularly of the 40 days that Jesus spent in the wilderness. You remember the story. Luke chapter three, Matthew chapter three, Mark mentions it as well, where they talk of Jesus immediately after his baptism, immediately after he is affirmed in his identity as the, the son of God with whom God is pleased and he is sent into the wilderness for 40 days of fasting, 40 days of, of prayer, 40 days of facing the devil and temptation, 40 days of, of trial. And Jesus comes through that that time of spiritual preparation. Preparation for what? For the next three years of mission and ministry that he came here to walk out on your behalf and mine. Lent is very much for us then, as it was for Jesus Christ. It is a 40 day time of surrender. Surrendering our own agendas, our own ideas, our own ways of being so that they may be redirected, realigned to God's ways, to God's purposes, to God's agenda. During that time, as you heard Shelby say, you, you might embrace fasting. If you wanna know what controls you, fast. 
All that stuff is gonna come to the surface. It's an unbelievably helpful and powerful spiritual discipline that God has given us. But in Lent, many of us embrace fasting. We, we, we endure testing so that the Spirit of God might better prepare us for what may come in our lives as we follow Christ in mission and on, in ministry, whether that's individually, whether that's as a church. And so it all starts, as we've been singing and praying and speaking all morning, it all starts with surrender. And this is the title of our sermon series for the next six weeks, leading us up to Holy Week. Surrender. Lent isn't about necessarily just giving up chocolate or giving up Netflix just for its own sake. It is an invitation to surrender ourselves to God, to grow deeper in dependence upon and relationship with him. It's a gift. It is such a gift. And so today we begin this first sermon in this series with what we're going to call the song of surrender. Psalm 25, verses one through 10. A psalm, how many of you know, it is a, it is a song. It's a, it's a poem, but it was meant to be sung. And so what we may recognize in Psalm 25 is that this is David's song of surrender. David was certainly a man who surrendered his life to the Lord, and, and this song of, of many that he composed throughout the collection of the psalms, but this one shows us how he has done it. But before we get into those details, let's first define the term, shall we? This is always so important. What does it mean to say that we surrender? I can use that word and have an idea in my mind, and you may have one in yours, but do they align? Well, let's find out. Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines the term this way, and this is how we'll use this term throughout this series. Surrender is the action of yielding one's person. That means yourself, your life or giving up the possession of something into the power of another. So think about that for a moment. Let's keep that up there. The action of yielding one's person, yielding your life, yielding who you are, or giving up the possession of something into the power of another. So let me ask you this question. Would you say that surrender carries with it a positive or a negative connotation in our culture today? What do you think? Negative. I, I think almost any of us, any of us would, would, would agree to that, right? Uh, surrender is usually considered negatively in our culture. Why? Because it implies what? It implies losing, doesn't it? One of the things that I have learned so clearly in my years as a pastor is that people do not fear change, people fear loss. When people fear change, what they're actually telling you is, I fear what change is going to cost me. What I'm going to lose. So think about that in your own personal relationships. Think about that if you lead any group of people anywhere at any time. Think about that. When you're engaging change, what you have to continually work overtime to do is try to help people understand what is going to be gained, not just lost. Easier said than done. But when it comes to this idea of surrender, it implies losing in our culture. To surrender according to the ways of the world is to lose. I mean, think about ideas of war and battle. Think about, uh, on, I mean, who surrendered <laughs> the Super Bowl title last Sunday, and I'll stop there. But when it comes to ways in which we surrender, we think of losing. How is giving up your person, losing yourself, losing your power, losing your possessions to someone or something else, how is that considered anything but losing in our culture? But that's according to the ways of the world. When it comes to the ways of the kingdom, or the way of the kingdom, that's the exception. That is where Surrender is not loss. Surrender is nothing but gain. Even if you don't see it at first. Even if you don't understand it that way from the start. And the whole point being that when you surrender in the way of the kingdom, it's all about who you are surrendering to. That's what we have to understand. Surrendering to the king himself. Lent, you'll notice, we've changed out the wraps upon the cross, they're no longer the white of epiphany. The runner on the table is no longer the white of epiphany where we ask God to give us eyes to see the the light of revelation. Now they are the, the purple of royalty, the purple of the king. The color of lint 
is recognizing that Christ the King has come and yet do we have eyes to see him for who he is? Will we surrender our lives to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords? Surrendering your life to him is not losing your life, it's actually gaining it. According to the kingdom, surrendering your life to the Lord is not your defeat, it is your salvation. Remember what Jesus said, right? If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. You must take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, this is, the, this is the great paradox, right? If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it, Jesus said. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, you will find it. You will save it, he says. That's a whole series of sermons in and of itself. And next week, Pastor Greg will be back with us. He'll be talking about that very passage, unpacking what does that mean to take up your cross. He'll be talking about the the blessing of surrender next week. But this morning, we need to turn our attention back to Psalm 25 and ask the Lord through this song of his servant, David, how do you surrender your life to God? This is what we need to know. How do you and I surrender our lives to God? It's one thing to say it with our lips. It's another thing to do it in how we actually live moment by moment, breath by breath, day by day. David was not a perfect man. None of us are. None ever has been, save Jesus Christ. But David was, even in his multiple imperfections, a man surrendered to God. And because his life was surrendered to the Lord, we read of him repeatedly doing three things again and again and again in his life, and they are testified to over and again in the Psalms, including in Psalm 25. A man surrendered to God, David consistently turned to the Lord for three things. He turned to the Lord for help and deliverance, he turned to the Lord for guidance, and he turned to the Lord for forgiveness. The question today is, do we do the same thing? If your life is surrendered to God, you are increasingly recognizing how much you need his help, how much you need his guidance, how much you need his forgiveness. And when you turn to him, as we're going to see David do, in humility, trusting in who God is by his character, by his nature, how God is and who God is are one and the same. When you do that, You recognize God is faithful to provide his help, to provide his guidance, to offer his forgiveness, which we all need so desperately. So this is what it means, in part at least, to live a life surrendered to God. So I ask you again, do you do that? Are you surrendered to God in this way? And if right now you're not sure, if right now you're asking, well, I I don't really know, well, let Let me ask you this, do you humbly turn to God for help? And we'll unpack that here in a moment. Do you humbly turn to God for guidance and direction? Do you humbly turn to God for forgiveness? And hear me, this isn't a one-time thing. This is about a life style. This is about a way of following Christ. What we're talking about here is, is a life of repentance. So where do we start? Well, we start like David did. We turn to God in prayer, even in song, as we begin with Psalm 25. So go there with me. If you have your Bible, please turn there. If you have your phone, scroll there, whatever you need to do. But it'll be on the screen, of course, as well. But this is one thing where the word is essential in helping us understand not only David's thought, but more importantly, the word of God coming through him. David begins Psalm 25, and again, I'm reading the New Living Translation, and different translations may use a different term here, but David says, oh Lord, I give my life to you. Some translations say, I give my soul to you, which is the essence of your life, right? It is the essence of who you are, the core of your very being. And so when it comes, could there be a more blatant statement of surrender than that? Lord, I give my life to you. Remember our definition, to to give up one's own person. To surrender is to do that. That's what David says. I give my life to you. I trust in you, my God. 
How could he do that? Why would he do that? He gives his life because he trusts in who God is. Verse two answers that very question. How can he give his life because he trusts who God is? He trusts how God is. David knew enough of God and had experienced enough of God in his life to know that God is trustworthy. Some of you have extreme trust issues. And when you share your story about what you've experienced in life, anybody can see why that is the case. Some of you think right now, I don't know anybody I can trust. Or at least it seems that way. But what you have to take a risk upon is that when, when the Bible teaches us that God is trustworthy, it might seem like a risk right now to take that on faith. But I'm just a preacher that's asking you to do that. This is what David did. And, and the more you walk with God, the more he will prove himself to you in that way. The more his trustworthiness will be demonstrated in your life. But how many of us can say, if you, if you can't take my word for it, look around at your brothers and sisters, how many of you can say, can testify today that God is trustworthy? Raise your hand if, if he has proven himself to you, at least, yeah, amen, amen. So surrendered to God, David knows that he can turn to God, first of all, for help. Let's just be as practical, pragmatic, and honest as we can. Most of us, if we've ever turned to God, we've turned to him for this first, right? You have found yourself at the end of your rope. You don't have any more options. You've tried to figure it out. You've tried to make it happen. You've turned to everybody else you know, and you're finally desperate enough that you turn to God some way, somehow for help, right? God's not offended by, by that. God is not upset by you turning to him for help. We're supposed to do that. We're supposed to do that. This is where so many people, you know, why did Jesus say crazy things that really trouble our culture because we're the most affluent culture in the history of, of humankind? When he says, like, it's, it's impossible for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. When he says something like that and we immediately try to dismiss what he's saying or qualify it or justify it, this is what he's talking about. Because when it comes to asking God for help, if you have all the resources and you think you're good, how hard is it for you to do this when you don't think you need to? This is why we struggle. What kind of help did David need in particular in this case? He goes on, verse two, he says, do not let me be disgraced or let my enemies rejoice in my defeat. No one who trusts in you will ever be disgraced, but disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. How many of you know that David had plenty of enemies? Just a few. 72 of the Psalms talk about enemies. Did you know that? Almost half of them talk about enemies. David had a lot of people problems. Everybody knows the story of David and Goliath, of course. That's probably the most famous one, whether you've ever read or heard anything else about David through the scriptures or not. But in Psalm 25, David here is calling upon the Lord for help, for deliverance in this way, that he would not be disgraced. Older translations say that he would not be put to shame. How? By his enemies triumphing over him as he seeks to live in obedience to God. David prays, he says, let those be disgraced who seek to deceive others and live in ways contrary to the way of God. Again and again and again, we see this throughout the Psalms, that the cry is, don't let me be disgraced or put to shame, not for my name's sake, but for yours, O oh God. You are the one who helps those who call upon you. You are the one who is the deliverer after all. So let me ask you this morning, you may not be facing enemies of flesh and bone like David did plenty of times, but you and I surely have at least one spiritual enemy. And how he comes against us or how the flesh wars against us in our lives, and we are especially mindful of that usually during the season of Lent, we, we, we think about what are the things that we struggle with. What are our vices? What are our sins that we think we'll never overcome? What are the things that we uh, think we can't give up what are the things we think we need even more than the Lord, if we're honest? What are the enemies you face today? 
What forces are present in your life which threaten to triumph over you in your obedience to Christ? In other words, what power of darkness is at work in your life attempting to disgrace and defeat you as a follower of Jesus? Have you ever thought about it like that? That there are powers that be, principalities, forces of darkness and wickedness that are very intent upon working in our lives in ways that we don't even recognize in order that they might divide and distract and distort us, those who are made in the image and likeness of God. Lent is a time to take stock and reflect and recognize where is that happening in my life? Then the next question is, what do I do about it? Because you might be saying, Ben, I I have thought about this and I don't think I have the power to defeat this. I don't think I have the power to overcome this. I don't think I have the power to win in this way. If you're thinking that way, good. Because you don't have the power. You don't have the strength. You don't have that within you. But he does. This is what surrender is all about. So many American Christians, we've been taught from the day we were born. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Make it happen. Survival of the fittest, baby. If you can't do it, get out of the way, loser. Somebody else deserves your spot. That's how we're taught in business. That's how we're taught in school. That sure is how we're taught in sports. That's how we're taught in church. If you ain't the best and the brightest, you ain't gonna get a microphone up here. Forget that. That's how people get trained. That's how people get taught. And it's totally the opposite of the kingdom of God. And so we get discipled as Christians in the ways of secular society that may or may not have had Jesus stamped on top, and then we come to church and wonder why it's such a mess. Let the word of God redirect your thinking. Repent and let him change your mind. Because then how we live just might change as well. If you would surrender your life to God as David did, if you would turn to him for help, because whether you know it yet or not, you need it, and you would continue to turn to him for help, what does he say? David says, no one who trusts in you, God, will ever be disgraced. The longer you live turning to him for help, the more you will see how much you need him. It isn't like, oh, I just need you like a pair of crutches for a while, God, because I twisted my ankle, but once I'm strong enough, I can throw the crutches away and I'll be fine. That's not what it's about. The longer you walk with him, the more you will understand how much you need him. And that is not a sign of weakness. It is his strength in you. His power in our weakness is more than sufficient. Make turning to God for help your first response, not your last resort. Trust me and see what a difference that will make in your life. Surrender to him. David understood as well that we turn to him, we surrender to him for help, but we turn to him for guidance. That's the second one, for guidance. Psalm 25, verse four. Listen to what he says here. Listen to these verbs. Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me. For you are the God who saves me. All day long, I put my hope in you. Look at those verbs. The action words that David calls upon the Lord to do on his behalf as he surrenders to God. Show, point, lead, teach, save. And and here's the thing. David was a man of remarkable skill. He had tremendous skill. He had talent. He had competence. He had ability. He had significant experience. He absolutely had boldness and ambition. And yet... He had learned he needed God's guidance every single day of his life. Now you might be thinking, well, I know enough about David's life, Ben, to know that he made some mistakes, some massive mistakes. He was an adulterer, he was a murderer. He did all kinds of things rashly at times and lost his temper and it it cost all of Israel greatly. And you'd be absolutely right to say all of those things. Again, we said David's not a perfect man and thank God that he's not because we could never look to him as any kind of example for us if he was but he was surrendered to God and understood the longer that he lived, the more that he needed God's guidance, the more that he needed his direction. Even when he had enough experience to know what to do in almost any given situation he would face as the king of Israel, 
he still understood that he needed God to show him the right path. Do you know that? He still needed God to point out the road for me to follow. If you're like me, almost any day of your life, you see 14 different paths. Which one do we go down? How do we do this? Which way do we go, Lord? Show me the right path to follow. Do you pray and surrender that way? And he says, lead me by your truth. The truth that is not only God's teaching, but is definitive of God's persons, of who he is as Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Truth defines who God is. For you are the God who does what? David says, you are the God who saves me. Do you see God that way? Not, God, you might save me. God, I hope I can trust you because if you don't come through here, I'm walking the tightrope without a net. Do you, do you see him as you are the one who saves me? Be bold in that way. Pray in that way. Declare that, not, not, not that God needs to know, but you need to know. Declare that to your own soul. All day long, I put my hope in you. Do you do that same thing? Do you seek God's guidance all day long? Or do you do your 15 minute devotional in the morning and you're like, okay, that's great. Close it and you get another cup of coffee and you go throughout your day and you never think about him again. I'm not trying to browbeat you or that's not it at all. But one of the greatest joys in your life will be when you realize that God goes before you, that God is before you, he is behind you, he is around you, he is alive within you by faith in the Holy Spirit alive in you and and everything you face, everywhere you go, everything you're a part of in your life, you you never know, you never know how God's gonna reveal himself to you and what God's gonna do in interactions with other people, how he's gonna speak to you through something as simple as I mean, this morning when I'm in my office and I'm in prayer and I'm preparing and here comes a, a tufted tip mouse who keeps banging on the, on the door and, and, and or the window of my office and just, just the beauty of God's creation and, and, and how God speaks to me tenderly in that moment. It just You never know. But do you see him as giving you, wanting to give you guidance all day long? Remember what David said in another psalm, Psalm 119, verse 105. You know this, your word is a lamp to what? To my feet and a light to my what? My path. So why is is the word, both the written word and and, and the word incarnate, Jesus Christ himself, why is that the primary core value of, of us as Christ church? Because we believe that The light that comes through his word is meant to show us the way, to lead us in the way. You gotta read it, (laughs) you gotta meditate upon it, you gotta study it. I hope that you're doing that every single day. Some of you are rocking and rolling through the Bible in a year and and that's that's wonderful. Others of you have come up and you've said something to me and you've said, Ben, I I try to do that, but I get like two verses in and I'm just just lost in thought and meditation upon what, what, Oh Lord, I give my life to you. I trust in you, my God. What does that mean? And you're, you're there for 30 minutes in prayer and meditation. That's wonderful too. The point is, how is the word being read not only by you, but how are you being read by the word? David understood this. He knew he needed God's guidance. And one of the greatest resources we have is the scripture that we've been given for that. So are you struggling today like a blind person in the dark? Then turn to him, surrender to him for guidance. If you're somebody today who feels like you got a good thing going on, you got to figure it out, you're firing on all eight cylinders, you're pretty competent in what you're doing, you got the skills to make it happen, guess what I'm going to say to you? Surrender to him, turn to him for guidance. Because when you do, God will show you things and teach you things you never knew you needed to learn. And you'll be amazed at two things, both his power and your ignorance. And that will lead you into the third thing that we need to do, which is surrender to God for forgiveness. Turn to God for forgiveness as David does. Psalm 25, verse six, he says, remember, O Lord, your compassion and unfailing love which you have shown from long ages past. Remember that, David says, and don't remember. Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in the light of your unfailing love, for you are merciful, O oh God. David calls upon God to remember God's compassion, God's enduring, faithful, committed love, because David knows the ways in which his own faithfulness has failed. Anybody else ever been there? When you fail God, 
Don't focus on your failure. Turn your eyes upon his faithfulness. Turn your eyes upon who he is. Do not listen to the voice of the enemy. Do not listen to your own voice that might condemn you. Uh, that, that's not what God wants for you. I remember one time when, when my son, my, my youngest son was, was just starting to crawl and I remember one time we were playing in front of the fireplace uh, in, our, in our living room and, and, and Zeke started, he was crawling up on the little, uh, there's a brick pedestal there and, and, and was trying to reach into the fireplace and I told him three times, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that and I was sitting there on the floor with him and he wouldn't listen to me and so the, the, the third time he did it, the fourth time, I, I picked him up and I gave him a little swat on the bottom and he started to cry. And I expected him as fast as he could to try to crawl away from me. But you know what he did instead? He climbed right up into my arms and he held on to me as tight as he's ever held on to me and buried his, his head right here in my neck. And I remember the Holy Spirit speaking to me in that moment. He said, when you fail, this is what I want you to do with me. I want to be the kind of dad that when my kids screw up, they say, I need to go to my father. Not that I'm afraid to tell my father. That's the kind of father I want to be for my kids. Okay? That's the kind of father we have in God. He wants you to turn to him, not run from him. And so when it comes to this understanding of forgiveness, surrendering to God in forgiveness, David understood, even though he committed some heinous sins that destroyed lives, there still was forgiveness for him in God. David has rebelled in sin before, back to Psalm 25, and he will say later in, in verse 11 of this same Psalm, he says he has many, many sins. He recognizes how much he needs God's forgiveness, and so who among us can't relate to that? Do not remember me according to my sins, David prays, but in the light of your unfailing love and mercy, O oh God. This is what it means to turn to God, to surrender to him in repentance, recognizing our need for forgiveness, his overwhelming desire to give it in his love, in his grace. And again, David turns in the next verse, verse eight, to focus upon who God is. The Lord is good. And he does what is right. I wanna pause there for just a minute because I know I know so many of you right now, you are struggling, you, 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 you know God is good, but you have no idea how what you're going through right now can be right. I said last week, God doesn't cause the evil in the world. We, we, are, we are creatures that, that make choices and we make decisions and we are, we are broken and we are, we are hurt people who hurt people and make poor choices at times. And so it gets messy quickly. But what we know is that God can turn and work all things together for good. Doesn't mean he causes all things. But there's nothing that he can't redeem. There's nothing that he can't bring out of even if it was meant to destroy you. Not God's desire to destroy you. But your enemy. The Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path. I love the way the older translations, he shows the way to those who go astray. So David knows that to surrender to this God, there's one thing that's essential. And he says so going on. You know what that is? Humility. Humility. Turn to God in humility. Humility is in short supply in our culture today. Everybody's, everybody's angry. Everybody's mad. Everybody has what they call, I don't know, some people call it righteous indignation. I, some, some other people would look at that and call it arrogance. I don't know. The question I am interested, though, in asking is where are we humble before the Lord? Lord. 
Turn to God in humility. David understood this. And why is this so important? Why is this key? He says in verse nine, God leads who? The humble in doing right. Teaching who? Them, meaning the humble, his way. What does it mean to be humble? Again, we must define the term. To be humble, it is a condition of sincere, straightforward behavior with a lack of arrogance or pride. One of our buzzwords in our culture today is authentic. Are you authentic? Are you real? Are you just being you? To be humble is to be more than that, however. To be humble is to be honest. To be humble is to to, to recognize that you don't know everything. To be humble is to recognize there is so much more you have yet to learn. To be humble is to be teachable. How can God teach you if you believe you have it all figured out, you just need God to just move the obstacles out of the way? Do you see the difference? David understood by this time in his life that, that, that God teaches the humble his way. So again, as we start to bring this to a close here, David knew that if he was going to give his life to the Lord and trust God with everything, if he was going to trust himself, everything about who he was and everything about what he had, everything about giving his life, surrendering his life to God, it meant that he had to turn to the Lord for help. That's what surrender means. Turn to the Lord for help. Deliverance from his enemies. You need that. I need that. David knew that to surrender means turning to the Lord for guidance all day, every day. You need that. I need that. David knew that turning to the Lord in surrender meant turning to him for forgiveness for his many sins. There isn't a human breathing breathing on the planet that doesn't need that. All of this done in a sincere spirit of humility because then, only then, in that kind of surrender can we ever hope, filled with the spirit of God, to follow God in obedience. Preachers like me get up and they start talking about obedience, 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 obedience and, 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 and Christians are defeated before they ever start because they start thinking about what they gotta do on the outside, hoping that all these things they're doing on the outside are eventually gonna change what's broken on the inside. That ain't how it works, folks. Jesus makes it clear that everything begins here. Everything begins from the inside out. David never talks about obedience until he's always talked about needing God's help, turning to God for guidance, seeking God's forgiveness in repentance, bowing before him in humility and living out of that posture, then God empowers us to walk in obedience. What's he say in verse 10, Psalm 25? The Lord leads with unfailing love and faithfulness all who keep his covenant and obey his demands. What did Jesus say? If you love me, keep my commandments. Most of the time, people shy away from that because they read it backwards. Keep my commandments, and then I'll know you love me. That's not what Jesus said. That's not what he said. He said, love me and keep my commandments. God wants your heart first. He wants intimacy with you first. Nothing that God wants you to do can ever come to pass if we don't always, first and foremost, pay attention to who God is calling us to be in our intimacy, in our relationship with him. We have to get that order right. We have to understand that. And so this Lenten season, for these next six weeks, David did all of these things, turning to God for help, turning to God for guidance, turning to God for forgiveness. I pray that we will be doing those things every day. If you're not already, now is the time to begin. But David did that, remember, knowing God to be good, God to be faithful, God to be merciful and abounding in steadfast love, that God above all, in all of these things, was trustworthy. Do you believe that this morning? Do you know him in that 
way, to be that way, you can. Or maybe today you just need to be reminded that's who he is. It's easy. If you're spending hours a day scrolling social media, all the negativity, all the division, all the arrogance, all the anger, all the finger pointing to who's to blame for whatever we're dealing with, all of these things, and so few, so few voices are saying, create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your free and holy spirit. That's David's prayer in Psalm 51. After he'd committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband killed by sending him to the front lines of battle where he knew he would not return. Whatever you've done in your life is probably not too much worse than that. May our prayer this Lent be created in me a clean heart, O oh God. So how do you surrender doing this today? How do you surrender? First of all, recognize again, God has created you for relationship. He desires that with you, to know him personally, to know him intimately. You have to recognize your need for him. Admit your need for salvation. Today, the church is, is erring when it's trying to help people understand uh, that, that if you just add a little Jesus to your life, it's gonna just make all your hopes and dreams come true and it'll, it'll just be better. That's a watered down, weak, impotent gospel. It's not the truth. The truth is you need him to be saved. And if you don't know you need salvation, keep living. Keep living. If you don't recognize where sin is tearing apart your life, it's tearing apart your relationships, maybe it's because you're blaming everybody else but yourself. Maybe it's because you're recognizing yourself as a victim far beyond what anybody else in your life could possibly make you. Do you see you and I, apart from him, we are sinners who cannot save ourselves. And then you have to believe what Christ has done for you, that through his death on the cross, we've been singing about it all morning, he has dealt with sin, that we might be forgiven, that we might be reconciled to God through him. On the cross, we talk about that all throughout Lent, Jesus takes the sin of the world upon himself. He absorbs in himself all that which would Divide us from God, from each other, and even from rightly knowing ourselves. Through his death, we are given life. Through his resurrection, he is victorious, not only, not only over the bondage of sin, but even through death itself. Death does not have the final say for anyone who puts his or her faith in Christ. That's so important. You don't have to live in fear of death as a Christian. The old song is, is right, everybody wants to go to heaven, just not today. Maybe some of us do. But do you see what this surrender and life of surrender looks like? So what do we do? We repent, we confess our sin, we surrender our lives to the one and the only one who is worthy, the only one who has the power to save, the only one who deserves our unconditional allegiance and our loyalty in love. So I'm gonna ask you to do that this morning. I'm gonna ask you to surrender your life, turn it over to him if you have not already done so. But even if you have, and this isn't just an altar call, come on up, Otto. It's not just an altar call. This is a situation where if you need to rededicate your life, and I know there are many of us in this room that need to do that. And this isn't about looking at anybody and saying, oh man, I didn't know she needed to get right with God. That's not what this is. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm at the front of the line today. I am. I'll confess to you right now that this last year, there have been far too many times I have had to stay up late into the wee hours of the morning by my own choice, not God's, trying to figure out how I'm gonna fix certain things that we face and struggle with as Christ Church Nashville. I repent of that today. I have responsibilities in my role. I have obligations in my role, but I have, in trying to do a good job, I have let that weigh too heavy upon my life and upon my family in this last year. I, I can't do that anymore. And I submit that to the Lord, saying, God, it's your, it's your church, it's not mine. 
It's, it's, it's yours to lead and guide and direct. It's yours to be the one that whatever you're going to do about our debt, whatever you're going to do about whatever we need to deal with in all these ways, it's yours. It's yours. And I thank God for every single one of you who, who, who pray. You pray not just, not just for me or my family, as much as I, I'm so thankful for that. Thank you, and don't stop, please. But, but when it comes to how you pray for what God is doing, and not just in us, but, but through us, because I know enough of who he is, and I know enough about the kingdom. I know enough of the word to know that, that, that he promises to lead his people through. And that's what he's doing. So what, what is that for you as Lent begins now and as we walk through these next six weeks and we take this journey together, leading us all the way to the glorious celebration, the Feast of the Resurrection on Easter Sunday, when we get there, what is this next six weeks going to be intentionally for you? How do you need to turn to him for help? Humbly. How do you need to turn to him for guidance? Humbly. How do you need to turn to him for forgiveness? And if you don't know what that is, just say, Holy Spirit, Show me any wicked way that was, is within me, and he will. He will. And confess that humbly to him. And trust in him, in him, to work in your life to bring healing, to bring wholeness, to be your salvation. No matter what you face right now, this, this is for every single one of us, every single one of us. So I'm gonna invite you right now. If there's something you wanna lay before the Lord, come, come down front, go ahead and come down, lay it at the altar, give it over to him. Yes, you can do this in your seat. Yes, you can do this with us online, I know. But sometimes our bodies help our souls move in the right direction. Sometimes we gotta get our butts out of the seat and move. And, and it's, it's not moving God to do something, but it, it, it jars something in us. It moves something in us. And so Christ Church, let us surrender anew to the Lord. I don't care how many years you've been walking with him. I don't care how well you know him. If your heart is like David's heart, a heart after God's own heart, you know that we can't get to the end of our need for him. We can't get to our end how much we need to grow in our dependence upon him our awareness of that dependence our awareness of how faithful he is in his goodness, his love, his mercy his compassion his justice, his righteousness his holiness speak to him right now surrender in the words of David Lord I give my life to you confess to him surrender to him
times have you sang that song and you haven't understood what you were actually singing? Don't let today be that same thing. To follow Jesus is costly. It's costly. It will cost you everything you are. All he wants from you is you. All he wants from you is all of you. Not the cleaned up, scrubbed up, nice and squeaky, perfect on the outside you. No, 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 who you really are. All the scars and warts and hurts and hang-ups, your brokenness, your addiction, your fears, your anxiety, all the ways in which you know you are broken. That's what he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I, I, Jesus says, will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me. Let me show you, let me teach you, let me lead you, let me save you. For he says, I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. You will find rest in your life. You will know the peace of Christ no matter what you face, no matter what circumstances you may have to walk through, no matter what fire of trial may come. Surrender to him. Surrender to him. So just a moment, I'll speak the benediction over us. But if you need to stay in this space, you can stay at the altar as long as you need. You can stay in the pew as long as you need. If there's something that God's calling you to do and moving to pray with or pray for someone, if there's something that, that you believe God has laid upon your heart that you need to share with somebody, trust him. Step out in obedience and leave the consequences to him. Father, we thank you. We trust you, we praise you for who you are. Lord, we surrender our hearts. We surrender the heart of your church in this individual local congregation that is Christ Church, connected to your broader body that spans time and space. Lord God, your church is your people grafted into your covenant people through the blood of Jesus Christ. We are yours. And so we surrender to you, knowing you are mighty to save. You are our help and our deliverer, Lord God, at all times, in all circumstances. Why should we be discouraged? Why should we be afraid? May we trust in you. Strengthen our faith as you move on our behalf, Lord God. We thank you now. Lord, we turn to you and surrender to you for guidance, Lord. Show us the right path of all those that we could choose, of all the ways before us, Lord. Show us the one. Lead us in it, Lord Jesus. You are the way, the truth, and the life. Lead us in it in the power of your spirit. Lord, we surrender to you for forgiveness, Lord. Heal us. Forgive us our sins, for they are many. Convict us, Holy Spirit, that we might be healed. Lead us in the way of repentance that we might be changed, that we might delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name, O oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Go to love and serve the Lord, to love and serve one another, and surrender to him. Amen.